when Mayer came out of jail, right? He came up to me and he was like, yo, those pigeon dunks you got, I got one in jail. What up, this is Jeff Staple and this is Beyond the Box with Sneaker News. I'm the founder of Staple, Reed Space, creative director of Extra Butter, amongst other various things that I try to do and keep busy with. Uh, I would say I'm a New Yorker, yeah. I was uh, born in Jersey, but I've been living in New York for uh, 25, 30 years now. So I'm an appointed New Yorker, I would say. I mean, my earliest memories of sneakers really uh, were connected to sport. You know, like I was a big tennis fan, so I was a big Agassi fan. Uh, Michael Chang fan, um, of course, just, you know, first Asian that really did it on, on the pro level. So that was my first foray into sneakers, um, but it was really to play sport first. Like, so I was getting the air tech challenges and the Reebok uh, tennis ball pumps and stuff to actually play sports in. Um, it was probably the, even the Jordan one, I was using that to like play sport in and the Jordan two, it was really the Jordan three that was like the first shoe that turned into like another sort of like language. It wasn't just a sports shoe, it was like a piece of art that I wanted to collect and clean and covet and, and rebox and you know relace all the time and stuff. So I think um, that shoe designed by Michael Jordan and Tinker Hatfield was the one that changed it for me. I, I distinctly remember like the Jordan 1s and the Jordan 2s, I was trashing them and I didn't really care. Like it didn't bother me, you know. I remember the Bo Jacksons, the Cross Trainers, the Air Tech Challenges, all Air Revolution. I remember I would be, I, I, I remember with the Air Revolutions, with the visible airbag, when they popped and like when they were going flat, I would be proud of that, that like I used it so much that it became flat. But with the Jordan 3, something else happened. Like I'd bring those home and I'd be picking little pebbles out of the grooves on the outsole and stuff and trying to repaint the back of the shoe like with, with a airplane model paint just to keep that like back plate really clean. Back in the day, like, you know, the only place to get shoes was really like, at Foot Locker and Athlete's Foot and Models, you know, like, and what was dope about that time was like, you'd have a wall of shoes from every sport in every category, and it's your job as a quote unquote sneakerhead to pick the ones that were right for you, and, and how you remixed it is what made you fly. Everyone has the same thing to choose from, whether you're a 60 year old dad or a 13 year old kid, everyone's got the same wall to pick from. And now how do you make that look fly? That was the challenge back then, you know? I didn't open Reed Space with the intention of making a cool sneaker shop. The intention was to make a community center that gave back to the neighborhood on like art, design, streetwear, culture. And sneakers are just a part of that culture. So of course we started to incorporate footwear, um, but it's just different now where like, you know, people open up stores now and before they open up, they want to make sure they've got like the Jordan retro count and like, you know, they've got all the tiers all set up and ready to go. And there's a lot of jockeying that goes along with that. And that's just the nature of the game. I'm not bad mouthing it, but like it's just become much more manufactured and like processed versus like organic, you know. We started to get hit up by brands to like put certain select product in there. We had been working with Nike before Reed Space even opened um, on some design projects, so that was a natural in. I remember the Kobe Zoom 1s launched at Reed Space with Kobe coming down from MSG after he scored like 75 points or something like that. He came down with Bobito Garcia and we did a talk at Reed Space, which was ridiculous. All right, what do we have here? This is a nice box. You want me to just open this box now? All right. Ooh. Pink box. All right. Let me tell you about the pink box, first of all. The pink box is, is uh, holds near and dear to the hearts of um, SB fans. You know, in this era of sneaker culture, when the SB dunks were really, were really alive and kicking was like the, probably in my opinion, the last real golden age of sneaker culture. Um, you know, they first did the boxes in gray and then they came out with the pink box and it just signified something that was like a real shift in the culture. And it was, I think, a real shift in the fact that Nike was acknowledging um, the sneakerheads. All right, we recognize sneaker culture, sneaker collectors, sneakerheads. Let's start making product for them, you know? Um, and I would have to argue that for better or for worse, I don't know if that like was a good thing necessarily, but you know, like NSW, which is Nike sportswear, when you know, back in this time, Nike Sportswear was a tiny little renegade division within Nike. Like it was like a dozen people within Nike trying to figure out how to make this product. Fast forward today, NSW is the biggest division of Nike. 
Ah, uh, yes. All right. So this is, I, didn't, I don't know what I'm even gonna see when I open this, so it's kind of like a surprise. You're catching me at a moment. But this is the, the 2.0 iteration of what we did. There was a long gap between dropping the first one and the second one. Um, and Nike and I had been talking for years, like more than five years, literally, about how do we bring back the pigeon? Why do we bring back the pigeon? And should we bring back the pigeon? These were all questions that were constantly going back and forth. And you know, Nike's obviously doing shit. I'm doing shit, right? So it's not like, it's not like it was in, in any rush for us to bring this back. Um, people who have that OG pigeon dunk, I also want to be respectful to them to not retro a shoe because, you know, me being a, a sneakerhead still, like, you know, it's weird when I see people wearing the Air Jordan 3 cements like all over the place. And I still find myself looking, like, sort of looking at their feet, hoping that they're the OGs, but of course they never are. And they're the new ones. And I, I get a little sad that like anyone could just get them now. You know what I mean? So I didn't want that to happen for uh, the pigeon dunks, which is why we went with this alternate colorway, the all black, the black pigeon, um, with still like the pink bottom sole. Um, just kind of like saying like, let's be respectful to the OG guys, you know, with the colorway that like everyone knows, which is this colorway, which is sort of like, the pigeon color now. We brought back the puffy tongue, which which recently Nike has gone to the to a new last that didn't have a puffy tongue. It has the, the skinny tongue. Um, so this puffy tongue is something that is very, you know, heartwarming to the heads of, of the SB culture. And then the pink box is, um, uh, I'm not sure what color they're running right now. I think they're running like a Tiffany blue box for regular SB. And I was like, we have to bring the pink box back. And it's not easy to just stop the presses on like a million gray boxes and or Tiffany blue boxes and then like run in some pink ones. Then it's working with Nike marketing, Nike PR to discuss how do we drop this thing? You know, really the shoe itself, even the original one was just a simple shoe. I wanted to make a shoe that people could wear, but it was the launch and the hype and the riot and the buzz afterwards that is what made the shoe something historical. Uh, so the launch of the shoe was gonna be, you know, much more important to be honest than the actual design. So a lot of people often wonder why the pigeon, you know, the pigeon to a lot of people is like um, street rat or vermin or like, you know, flying, flying rat or whatever. I had never found them to be disgusting. I actually found them to be kind of dope. They sort of like resonated with what it meant to be like a New Yorker to me. Um, they survive out there in the cold and the hot. They, they get food, you know, um, they're well fed. They're out there hustling. That's, that's just what I feel when I see a pigeon. And they're also not really scared of humans. You know what I mean? Like they're the only bird that doesn't fly away when you walk near it. They just sort of like, they actually stand in your way and you have to walk around the pigeon, you know? The pigeon uh, was being created in the same year that Nike asked us to do this shoe. So we already had pigeon sketches and pigeon marks and pigeon poop, um, <laughs> different pigeon poops. And so uh, when, when the call came, and I'll never forget the call, when, uh, when Nike called and, and they said like, um, you know, it's, it's an anniversary year coming up for the, for the dunk. And uh, we wanted to see if you were interested in creating a dunk that's dedicated to New York City. And I was like, Hell yeah, <laughs> you know, I was like, hell yeah, this is like my favorite shoe in my favorite city and I get to design it, that's like amazing. There was definitely at first like, what? A oh, that doesn't make any sense because they're not, they're from Portland, you know what I mean? So they don't get it. So we had to explain it to them and thankfully they trusted us that like this was gonna be something special. We got another box here, some black mold. Oh, snap, all right. Oh, okay. So I mentioned, these are dope. These are actually in pretty damn good condition. I mentioned that pre-Nike Pigeon, we were already designing shoes for Nike. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know about these, but like we actually designed like a good eight or nine shoes with Nike prior. But the thing is, the term collabs weren't, wasn't a thing yet back then. So it wasn't like, you know, they were asking us to design shoes. We obviously got paid for them. And it was like more like design work for hire than like collab. But to sneakerheads who know, this is a collab shoe. So we got two shoes in here. Um, and we got, first we have the Nike Air Max 90 Navigation Pack. And then part of the same pack, we have the Nike Air Burst. These are both women's shoes that we're looking at right now. And obviously someone bought these in a, in a very large women's size so they can wear them. I did the same thing. Nike had just invented this technology called the laser machine, right? <laughs> like they wanted to start lasering on shoes. And um, they had this space in Soho called 255 Elizabeth Street. 
and they had asked Mr. Cartoon uh, and Mark Parker and Mark Smith to design like three shoes that were just crazy pieces of work. Like they were just, you know, works of art, like all over Mr. Cartoon tattoo using the lasering machine, but they were mad limited. And you know, you had to go to 255 to buy them. So Nike called me up and said, we want you to help us work on the first commercially available lasered shoes. And then we came back to them with this idea called the navigation pack. If you wanted to get hot kicks, you had to hop on a plane and go to Tokyo and wait in line at Chapter or Atmos. And then you had to fly over to London and wait in line at Foot Patrol and get shoes and then bring them back over here. And there was like a little shop called like, you know, Vintage Kicks or like Clientele on Lafayette. And that's how the whole sneaker flipping resell thing happened back in the day. So if you were a sneakerhead back then, you were literally like Indiana Jones out there, you know, like planes, trains, automobiles, you know, like hustling people, like doing sick trades. That's how you were, that's how you were getting shoes, you know? And so I was inspired by this, by this navigation aspect by land, air, or sea. So these two actually represent land and sea. Um, and then on another level, I, I remember this pitch deck was crazy. Like it was so deep. So not only did we do land, air, and sea, but then we connected land, air, and sea to three cities. And the three cities are the epicenters of street and sneaker culture, which is New York, London, and Tokyo. And if you look at those three cities, you know, um, New York City is very much about the land and the geography of the, of the island. Uh, London is all about the weather patterns and it's constantly raining and it's like so turbulent, the weather. And then Japan is an island and you know, sushi and fish, it's all about the sea. The sea is so important to the island of Japan. Um, so for the New York one, uh, you can see that there is a map lasered onto the shoe and it's actually a block by block map view of downtown New York City from sort of Tribeca to Chinatown to Soho. Um, every single block is represented. That's like, you know, Franklin Church and West Broadway over there, you know, and it's like every block is perfectly done. And the lasering machine is what allowed you to get that detail. So we were like flexing on what the laser machine can do. And it was also dope that we did a men's and women's colorway. You know, that was pretty revolutionary for back then too. So this is the navigation pack for New York City. This is the Japan Sea edition. Um, and these are actual um, water current mappings from the ocean currents that surround Japan, like line for line, you know. Um, and so we had our designers sort of trace every single water wave that goes around Japan um, and it's represented on the shoe. Again, details that you couldn't get just from like embroidery or silkscreen, it had to be lasered. And this is, um, this is OG, OG stuff, man. This is awesome to see.